save them. Yes, ma'am. It is February 5th, 2021, and you are listening to episode 29 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. Thanks for all of the positive response from the Mendelssohn Scherzo video that I posted on YouTube this past Monday. I hope to do more videos like that in the near future, so if you liked it, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can find a link to my channel via my website, candidclarinetistpodcast.com, or through the YouTube browse function. I'm really hoping to reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so I would really appreciate it if you went over there and smashed that subscribe button. Kari Landry is our distinguished guest for today's episode. Kari is one of the founding members of the Acropolis Reed Quintet and also works as the marketing and development manager of the Acropolis 501c3 nonprofit organization. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, since 2016, Kari has been an intermediate lecturer at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, where she teaches music entrepreneurship courses. Kari, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So the first thing I want to ask you is how did this Acropolis Reed Quintet first come to be? It's such an unusual ensemble. So I want to know, like, how did you guys like meet each other and, and what was the uh, what was the influence for starting this group? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been together for over a decade now, which is oh. just sh shocking, uh, but so cool. And we met when we were all undergraduate students at the University of Michigan. We were just studying music performance there. Um, Matt Landry, our saxophonist, was studying music education. And uh, we started the group when we were all very young in school. Um, our oboist and bassoonist were actually freshmen at the university at the time, and I was a sophomore. And and we were really influenced, you know, by just trying to do something different within chamber music. And we were listening to different recordings and just hunting around and doing a lot of different things. And we found, uh, you know, the mother reed quintet, the Califax reed quintet, which is based over in the Netherlands, um, they're the founders of this reed quintet instrumentation. And at the time, there were maybe only, you know, two or three other reed quintets in the world. So it was a very, very unknown genre, instrumentation. And we we heard their sound and some of their arrangements. And we just fell in love with what the colors can do when they're combined together. So we, we joined forces when we were very young. And we started to play some of their arrangements out the gate and, and loved the energy and the vibrancy of the group. And that's how it really got started. We had absolutely no intention of it being our career. I certainly could not have predicted that I would be a full-time chamber musician that runs a nonprofit organization when I was a sophomore in college. Um, so that's, that's the origins of it. We were inspired by the sounds of Califax. And there we really ran with it and started to commission a lot of our fellow students. We really uh, caught the bug for creating new music for the genre and for the instrumentation. And that all started when we were in school. We were very hungry and tenacious to, you know, kind of make our mark within this chamber music genre because we just fell in love with the sound and the instrumentation. <laughs> yeah. So I have I had the questions in a bit of a different order, but now that we're on this topic. Um, so initially when you guys like first met, you know, first read through is did you get all your music from this califax i i, I apologize i'd never heard of them uh yeah. until now but so do, do do they have like stuff ab available uh for sale or something you guys were just like okay we like each other we're gonna we want to play together let's get this music and just read through it is that kind of how it started yeah, honestly, it was um, our original saxophonist who found a, a lot of these arrangements. One of the first arrangements we read was like a Bach arrangement, and we just kind of picked our friends based on, you know, people that we liked and uh, didn't know each other too well, um, you know, before the group started and then just developed this like lifelong bond. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, so we, we found the music online, and um, that was the initial spark of how we, how we started, yeah. Cool. And 
for a background, can you just just give everyone the instrumentation? Because you know, when I say reed yeah. quintet, people are like what what is that? So, <laughs> so so just just a basic rundown of like who your you know who composes your group. What Absolutely. what is the composition of your group? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm on B flat clarinet, and then in addition to that, we have a bass clarinetist. Um, we have oboe and bassoon and saxophone, and uh, we all uh, tag team on a few different instruments as well. Um, you know, I'll do B flat and A a lot of the times. Our oboist will play English horn. Uh, Matt, our alto saxophonist, will also do uh, soprano sax, and so it's a, a lot of shuffling too. So we can really expand it. Um, past just the five reed instruments yeah and that's what i was going to ask like i i think that particular instrumentation offers a lot of versatility it just in terms of all the auxiliaries and stuff that you can play because you know you get a woodwind quintet together and you're a little limited you know the horn plays horn you know the bassoonist <laughs> plays bass i mean you can play contra yeah. bassoon and stuff but um I, th I think what a what a vibrant uh group for uh composers you know, because there's yeah. so, I mean, you know, first of all, composers love bass clarinet. I don't know what it is, but they just like, <laughs> they love it. Like they, yeah. I've had numerous composers profess their love to bass, for bass clarinet to me. Um, so, and then in like a group like that, you could have two bass clarinets if you want. <laughs> right. So, you know, so um, that's so cool. And, and uh, I, I'm glad, did you, who, did you already, I don't know if you already said this, but who, who found that group where it was just like. Oh, who, um, it was actually uh, a person who's the only person who's not in Acropolis anymore. It was okay. our original saxophonist named Dan Goff. Um, and he was in it for probably the first few months, actually. And then he won a military band job, which is like oh, one of him. the big goals of being yeah. in a saxophone school and everything. And um, so he, he left because obviously we were just like, a uh, freshman at the time and he was a grad student and uh you know we were just like all right let's find another saxophonist and um funny enough the the only other person that was available and free that we asked it turns out to be my husband now i mean it's right. just like so serendipitous how all of this comes together and so it's it's very funny <laughs> oh that's very cool so actually the first time that i found out about you guys was uh due to your uh performance in the fish off chamber music competition mm -hmm. um that's when I, I was like whoa that's so cool because I, I listened to, to a couple of the rounds that you guys played and uh yeah. first of all it's just beautiful it's great playing everyone there is very talented and and you guys clearly have a um you know a, a, a nice collaborative musical product so I, I I appreciated that when I was a, a young musician um but can you talk about that experience and 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 like was that sort of the like ignition that was like okay we can do this full time you know this can be our thing yeah um I, the experience itself is uh, i first of all i just highly recommend if you are a young musician, one of the best ways to get better and to really test your metal is to go do competitions. Uh, you will learn more in competing in a couple rounds of a competition than you will in like an entire year of schooling. It, it just puts you under so much pressure and um, teaches you so much. So first, firstly, you know, I just, I'm a huge advocate for them. I, even though it's like a scary thing and you could have lots of nerves going into it, it's something that um, really ha has made us so much better as mm -hmm. instrumentalists. So, um, but the funny thing about Fish Off is um, by the time we won it in 2014, that was actually the third time we went to the competition. Um, two years prior, we won the silver medal. And um, two years prior to that, we placed in the semifinal round. Um, and I definitely think that there's a uh, you know, kind of like a misconception that people go to these competitions and win things overnight and then everything changes for them. Right. Um, and I, I know the importance of them, but they're just as much of a journey and a process and a stepping stone. So we used all the competitions that we went to and we eventually won like fish off as an opportunity to just get better and better and better as musicians. And it was really never a question of whether or not we could do this as like a career. I actually don't think any of the competitions answered that question for us, but they gave us um, a sort of artistic validity that we knew we needed in order to enter the professional world. So um, it was actually after we won the silver medal um, in uh, oh, 2012 that uh, we were approached by a management company. And um, that was a 
huge launching point in our career so that we could have someone who was in the booking and presenter world actually contract gigs for us. Um, and then when we won in 2014, you know, a lot of people ask us if that was like your make make or break moment. But I, I truly want to say that it wasn't, you know, it was just uh, one more thing that we, you know, got over, made us better, made us truly believe that we could do this at a really high level. Um, but it's it's something that, you know, just gives you that like extra confidence boost to to keep going and kind of validates that you're on the right path. And especially for the reed quintet, I mean, the ensemble and the instrumentation is, you know, only about 30 years old in the grand scheme of classical music. And in contemporary classical music, you know, that's that can be very new and and can be shiny and everything. But in the big year history of everything, you know, competing against a string quartet as a brand new instrumentation is a very hard challenge. And so we felt that if we couldn't do that in this competition sphere, there was no way that we would get booked on a series like with the Brentano string quartet. So, which has happened now for us. So it's, it's very interesting how we used competitions to kind of uh, prove that. Um, and uh, it more in retrospect, I think it was more proving it to ourselves, not necessarily the field, but um, yeah, it was, it was a major, major learning process for us. And we grew so much as artists by taking part in not only the fish off competition, but all of the other competitions that we did, they, they made us so much better. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. And it's always, it's always those darn string quartets and the saxophone quartets. Those are the ones that are, uh, yeah. <laughs> that always win all the competitions. So, um, so I actually didn't know that you guys went three times. I thought you just went the once, but I guess, so I guess when was, when was the first time that you went? Oh man, um, I want to say 2010 was okay, the first time. Okay, that makes sense because that we that's probably when the the first time when I heard you guys because that's when I was still in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that makes that makes sense. Um, well, that's awesome, and congratulations to you and your your entire group. Uh, what an accomplishment to win that, and then not only win that, but have the determination to go back numerous times until you got you know what you wanted from it. <laughs> right. And also, um, you know, getting a management company is a huge deal, and that's a uh, that doesn't just that happens because you you put on a quality product. It doesn't happen because you get lucky. So that's right. a credit to you and your your colleagues for that. Um, so thank you. So now that you you are a group and you have management and you, this is your this is your career now. You guys are the Acropolis Reed Quintet. What kinds of concerts and recordings and education and content do you guys do that kind of keeps you busy throughout the year? <laughs> yeah, um, I have been shocked during this past year um, in this pandemic state. I think we've been busier than we ever have in our entire lives because we've been forced to grow and change and innovate and still do everything that we do, but in a completely new sense so that we can still contribute and reach people and perform and offer everything that we offer. Um, uh, as kind of a breakdown of everything that Acropolis does, we um, typically in a, in a normal year will be touring um, all around the country and the world, and we'll give probably about 50 or 60 like formal concerts and recitals um, on various series and various colleges. And uh, in addition to that, we probably give 100 plus uh, educational events, um, kindergarten through conservatory, uh, elementary presentations where we dress up in various funny costumes, Gotta love all, it. Yeah. The way, all the way to college teaching and master classes and coachings and music business boot camps, um, the, the whole gambit. And, uh, in between all of that, we're also, um, uh, based out of Southeast Mich Michigan. So we are currently in residence at three high schools in Detroit, and we work with these kids throughout the year. Um, their, their music programs have drastically been cut, and it's something that we just really care about bolstering. Um, so we uh, help with chamber music, and we teach with uh, music composition. A lot of these students get to write pieces for us that we premiere. Um, and so we we do a, a whole ton of things. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, Sounds like we've it. Always We've always been a group that has uh, always wanted to push ourselves at what we're capable of. So um, in addition to all the 
teaching and performing. You know, we we publish a catalog of our own sheet music of a lot of the pieces that we've commissioned. We've commissioned and premiered um, over 70 pieces for the reed quintet instrumentation. So it's something that we're very proud of and very, um, you know, love sharing with people all around the country and the world. And in addition to that, you know, we do lots of recording projects. We like to make sure that all of these pieces are, you know, available and out there for people to hear and supporting all the living composers today is something that we just deeply, deeply care about. So we um, we're actually releasing our fourth album this coming April 9th. Um, there's very little out there on the Internet about it. Now we're going to announce it publicly next week, um, but it's called Ghost Light and it's a uh, Oh, I think it's just a tour de force of an album. It's it's got some very very big meaty pieces on it that um, that we've commissioned recently, and so lots of recording and commissioning and performing and teaching, and um, yeah, that's that's basically everything that we do. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, it sounds like uh, you keep busy. I, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so uh, to that album, and you know, where can people? sort of find you guys is that you have a website a, a social media what's what's the best method of someone following uh, what you guys do yeah come check us out online um, our website is acropolisquintet.org that's acropolis with a k and uh, you can find us on facebook and instagram and twitter at the hashtag at acropolis five tet um, and we also have tons and tons of videos up on our YouTube page at the same handle, uh, big Spotify, iTunes. Um, we have three CDs up there already and a re- recent EP release that re- we released back in December of 2020. Um, so there's tons of music out there. And <laughs> it's like, geez, <laughs> yeah. God, I got to get my game together. You guys are all over the place. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, we move fast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's fantastic. And uh, I'm looking forward to... Uh, being able to listen to that new album. I'll, I'll, I'll really look forward to, to that. Uh, one question I did have too is, does anybody in the group do arrangements uh, yourself? Yes. Um, it's actually been a number of years since we have done the arrangements just because we, we've, over the years, just gravitated more and more and more to the new music written by living composers and sharing the stories that are happening today. Um, I think that all of our music now is becoming much more about the times that we live in and we're trying to reflect real people and, and real experiences. And, uh, we have done a lot of arrangements in the past. Uh, We sell a lot of those arrangements. Um, mainly our oboist and bassoonist are the ones who have done the arranging and, um, We've worked with some outside arrangers as well, people who are just really good composer friends of ours that are also just stellar arrangers and can can make something really special. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of our progression with playing and reimagining some some older things. But um, we tend to lean on the side of the the new music. <laughs> yeah, well, good for you, good for you. That's that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so once you guys became a five hundred one c three nonprofit, uh, how did you sort of delegate? like you know the different roles in the organization because obviously there's work to be done you know you guys don't it it doesn't just happen yes you have a management but you also have to raise money and then you know have a board or whatever Uh, i don't know how your organization is structured but there's there's definitely some leg work and so how did you guys Mm -hmm. sort of decide what the uh what the roles were going to be yeah so one of the big things that I talk about whenever I talk to young ensembles about how they can like divvy up work and responsibilities and cause it's a major question, right? Like you have all this stuff that you need to get done and who's going to do it, right? How are you going to figure this out? Um, is we learned pretty early on not to, you know, force people into certain roles or certain positions that everybody really gravitates towards their natural strengths and their natural interests and, And basically you can structure an ensemble and an organization, whatever it is, in the way that serves you the best, right? So I think from an outside perspective, it might seem that because there are five people, you need to do everything evenly, right? Um, But we're five people with five very different lives, unique situations, unique interests. And so the way we structured it was, is probably a structure that doesn't exist anywhere else in the planet. It's, it's unique to us. So, um, 
when we formed our business um, back in 2015, what we basically decided was that um, myself and Matt, my husband, are the two people who do all of the administrative work for the organization. Uh, and then the five of us are just basically artistic directors and any type of artistic programming or decisions or who we work with, where we perform, anything like that that we're building, that's all even based on everybody coming to the table with their ideas. So it's an artistic democracy. <laughs> and so, uh, but beyond that, all of the administrative work is done uh, by myself and Matt. Matt is our executive director and I'm the development and marketing manager. I should have given myself a better title, but yeah, that's, that's what I came up with. Um, I think it's and, a very fitting title for you because clearly you're very good at marketing. You're in all these different uh, places. So Right. <laughs> <laughs> And um, beyond that, we actually have um, an intern team as well. And then we have a five-person board of directors. So we have a lot of people that help build our support structure for all of the administrative work that we do. Um, our, our business... Um, is is you know growing every year financially and we're trying to basically diversify our pie <laughs> of mm -hmm. of where we make money from and so it's having more people in your court that have uh, other lived experiences and can bring this business acumen to our table is how we've considered uh, to grow and keep growing, um, especially throughout this year in in a pandemic state. You know, we've had to innovate so many different programming and um, and we've really stayed strong financially throughout all of it, despite all of this ups and downs and ebbs and flows and the fact that we haven't played an in-person concert, um, in, you know, six months. So it's, it's been great to have that kind of stability and to build it into an organization from the ground up. And so when it, when it comes to structuring things with other people, you, you have to build it with the people that you have at the table, not an different idea that you have, you know, in your mind. So, yeah. uh, that, that's how, that's how we work together. And, um, that's how we've continued to grow the business. Um, yeah. Well, good for you. Uh, do you do you think, you know, we're getting candid here on the Canada Clarinets, but do you think it ever gets a little bit um, like you have too many hands and too many cookie jars? You know what I mean? Like, like there's like some days where you're just like, I just need to practice, but you got to do a grant or something, you know? And, yeah. And again, feel free to answer whatever you're comfortable answering. I'm not saying like you can't handle any of it because obviously you're very successful and you can, but um but that, for me, that would be really challenging because, like, you know, for me with my podcast, it's like I love doing the interviews, I love doing the recordings and stuff, but then, like, all the editing and all the marketing is just like, oh, man, I just really want to practice, you know, <laughs> or whatever the case is, so. Yeah, no, and I, that is not the first time I've, I've heard that. Like, yeah. I think everybody is thinking about that, like, I just want to spend time doing my art because it's what I love to do. It fills me up. I know I need to get better at it, and it, it brings you so much joy, and that's what you're doing all this work for at the end of the day, right? To be able to actually perform and play your clarinet, <laughs> and so I, I definitely, you know, have days where you're you're questioning what the payoff of certain things is going to be. Um, but at the same time, um, what I've always felt is that all of this work that I do outside of practicing or outside of performing is just an extension of my artistic self. It's actually fuel that allows me the freedom to be able to commission people, play new music, give concerts, you know, make videos, all of that extra engine churning underneath, um, has to be connected to the practicing and the art or else you're just going to be constantly pulled apart by the two, right? If, if the two don't relate and the two don't support each other, then, you know, you're, you're going to have that guilt in the back of your mind of like, Oh no, I've been working on this grant for the past, you know, 48 hours and I haven't, I haven't touched my horn, you know, but, um, that that's the only way that you can justify, you know, putting in all of that work to something that, that, you know, theoretically could detract from your time, you know, practicing. But um, over over the last decade, um, we've gotten very good at if you're your your own boss, your own musician, you're running your own organization, you're the CEO of your life. That means that you have to 
determine what you do in a day. So no one is going to set your schedule for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think having those priority priorities on a daily basis is what keeps you, you know, fresh on your instrument, but also gets everything done behind the scenes. And so that's, um, the, you know, the culture that we've tried to build. I I say culture, it's just such a small little team (laughs) and we're all friends. Yeah. But Um, uh, it's, it's important for sure. Yeah. But that's, that's really, um, you know, and, and recognizing those thoughts. Um, if, if you have a day where you're just like, I, I wish I was practicing, I wish I was doing this right now. Um, you have to listen to yourself. And, uh, you know, if it's just like, I've, I've been beating myself over the head with getting this fundraising done or getting this grant done, or, you know, um, doing whatever it is administratively, um, it's, it's good to listen to yourself and to just step back and, and go work on, you know, the end end product sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and do you, I guess my other question too is like, do you kind of wish that you didn't have all those responsibilities where it's like, like, have you ever, or do you just love it and, and you, you couldn't see yourself anywhere else? Oh yeah. I love it. Um, I, That's awesome. I love how connected I am to the entire process. Um, I think if I was more removed and if someone else was doing all this work on my behalf and I was just a contract musician um, in an organization that was separate from myself, um, I wouldn't be able to institute any kind of change that I want. I I wouldn't be able to decide where the organization turns. You know, I wouldn't be able to pick what kind of art I want to make next and what kind of impact I want to have and how that could make me a better clarinetist. And so, um, one of our big, big collaborations that we just finished recording, that's actually going to be our fifth CD is Acropolis plus, um, a jazz pianist and a jazz drummer. So it's this amazing contemporary classical crossover collaboration um, with the pianist and composer Pascal LaBeouf and uh, the drummer for Jacob Collier. His name is Christian Newman. And the idea of doing this is something that could never be possible if someone else was steering the ship. And we wouldn't be able to push ourselves as artists if we weren't making all of those decisions. So I love having that control. And with that control just comes so much artistic freedom and growth. It's, it's really the only way that I think you can truly um, be in charge of, of your artistic message and what you contribute to the world is, is taking it by the reins like that. And, um, yeah, I think it, it definitely takes some years under your belt in order to, <laughs> to get it to that point. But once you do, you know, then it really pays off. <laughs> well, I gotta say, if you're ever interested in, uh, you know, being, a uh, le- a leader of an, uh, of a symphony orchestra, let me know. I'll, I'll put in a good letter of recommendation for you, man. You're just, <laughs> You're getting me all fired up for all this stuff. So I, uh, Good. I appreciate it. And just, just, I can just, I can hear, you know, being honest, I, I can hear the passion in your voice and yet like you really believe what you're saying. It's not just mm-hmm. cause it's your situation. And so that's cool. And I'm so glad that you like have this thing and, and it's just like, you're passionate about it to that level. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and you're passionate about every aspect of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and to me, you also seem like a, a lifelong learner where you love learning new skills and new, new things and, uh, learning about new things. Mm-hmm. And so that I'm sure that has served you well over the last, you know, 10 years kind of creating this whole, uh, Acropolis brand. So, uh, once again, congratulations to you for all of that success. Um, Thank and you. yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. Uh, so you teach music entrepreneurship. Oh, sorry. I, I skipped a question here. Uh, so I gotta, gotta go in order. I gotta, I gotta keep myself organized. So we're, we're backtracking a little bit, but, uh, you said, so you said you guys perform about a hundred educational services and 50 to 60 performances per year. Mm-hmm. So does that mean you guys are meeting pretty much like 300 days a year? Cause you're rehearsing, obviously you have to rehearse and learn music and stuff like that. Like I would assume there's not a lot of time off with that kind of schedule. Yeah, um, this is such a great question, and I love demystifying this. A lot of a lot of students ask us this question too. Like, man, you just must be together all the time and rehearsing all the time. And um, funny enough, we actually aren't. Um, we probably are together. I want to say about 
half the year. So do okay. really surrounding the engagements that we do. And then beyond that, we'll get together for a few weeks throughout the year um, and do things that we call retreats, where we just basically focus only on our artistic growth, you know, big brainstorming sessions, big rehearsals of new pieces. Um, but our members actually live all over the place. We're not, you know, within driving distance. Um, our oboist lives in Colorado. Um, our bassoonist lives in Ohio. He used to live in Florida. So uh, we've actually not been an ensemble based in the same city for over seven years. Um, the majority of our life together as as a ensemble. And so when we get together, um, it's really all about a strategic scheduling that we have. So if we're getting together for, say, a performance, um, for example, later in this month, um, we have a live stream concert uh, hosted by BGSU. We're on their new music series. And so we are going to get together maybe two days prior to that to rehearse the music, and then we're going to give the concert. And so there's a lot of uh, onus on the individual members to be absolutely 100% prepared when they come into the room. And um, when we were touring, how it would work is we would, you know, prepare and read new music that we might be playing months later when we got together for a performance. So we'd add like some book in time here and there to other gigs. Um, but we were pretty firm believers that um, if you can't get something ready within like a few day period of time prior to the gig, you know, then you probably won't be able to do it. <laughs> and yeah. that having that kind of pressure, it almost brings us back to that competition mindset, right? So we, we put a lot of pressure on everybody individually to be the best artists that they can be, to come in prepared to all of the rehearsals, to know absolutely everything about the music. It, it's often music that we've helped create. So we're very, very deeply invested in it. And the rehearsals are all about just bringing it to that next level of performance and talking about very minute details. Um, and so that's, that's how much we're together. And it's, it's, um, probably less than, you know, people think, um, we definitely have, um, other things going on in our lives yeah. that, you know, we use to balance everything. So, um, our oboist and, um, bassoonist and bass clarinetist all, um, teach outside of Acropolis, um, and have studios and things like that. And, um, Matt and I really do this full time, but, you know, we try and <laughs> get away from it every now and then to give a healthy balance that, is good. Yeah. yeah. That, that replenishing refueling. Um, mm -hmm. so during the pandemic, it's been a little bit different. Um, our oboist was, uh, drove out from Colorado, you know, back in the fall. And he spent about a month and a half out here at our home <laughs> so yes. that we could record all these, um, you know, pre-recorded concerts and do some of these live stream stuff, um, so that we could, you know, keep, keep making a living, keep making music. And so that's been the biggest change this year is I think we've actually seen each other more than normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I got. I just got to say, bless your oboist from going from Colorado to to sea level all the time. I can't imagine what kind of, you know, horrible situation he goes through with his reeds every time he does that. But um, yeah, he keeps he keeps them here at our house. <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, keep those yeah. things tempered because man, for for those I know I saw in your bio you went to Aspen. Man, I I did a summer mm -hmm. at NRO. Holy cow! It's 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 just a different. Yeah. It's so bizarre. You, like you can't even describe it. You're like, oh, my reads no. feel harder. It's like, no, it's it's not harder. It's just terrible. <laughs> there's no, yeah, like there's no <laughs> quantifying it. So, um, anyways, that's my uh, that's my beef for the day. <laughs> um, so you teach uh, music entrepreneurship class at University of Michigan, which must be pretty cool for you to like teach a class at your alma mater. Um, how has that experience been for you? And is there any advice you can give for people looking to do something like similar to what you do with Acropolis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have I've loved being able to go back to U of M and to be able to teach this. I've been doing it six years now, and it's it's just such a joy. Uh, the class just happens in the winter semester, so I'm doing it right now, and it's very very fun. Um, and I I love being able to share you know this this path as an option for artists that you can make your own career. Um, you can have a performance career that you create entirely yourself, and that is built around 
what you value and what you care about most. And so the advice and what I love helping people discover is how they can actually do that, right? And the advice that I give is that if you don't take charge over your artistic career, then you're going to end up somewhere else or somewhere someone else is going to take charge for you and give you a path. And if you want to say something as an artist and so many young artists today care about so much about what's happening in the world right now, they want to make a difference. They want to make things more equitable. Everything is important. And all of these young musicians want to be able to use their talent to make a difference, whether it's making sure that, you know, young musicians in their home community have access access to private lessons or can hear concerts or, or whatever it is. Um, there's, there's so much passion and fuel out there right now. And oftentimes that gets lost if you don't, you know, bet on yourself. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I love just preaching, um, essentially that you can do it, <laughs> you know, you just have to be committed to it. And I also like showing people that the path isn't a straightforward thing um, that essentially I worked um, a full-time job for probably the first five, six years of Acropolis that had absolutely nothing to do mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with being a clarinetist or running a nonprofit or playing in a chamber music ensemble. And my husband did the same thing. He helped small businesses in Detroit get healthcare for a number of years. Um, and you, you have to just keep these ideas churning underneath and keep betting on yourself, keep growing it as much you can little by little, because at some point it's going to tip at some point you're going to be able to own that dance studio. At some point you're going to be able to own that business and you're going to be able to be in charge of your whole artistic life, your whole artistic output and growing something little by little over a longer period of time, I think is really the only way that you can do it. And so if you're in school and you want to make something, you should start while you're in school. You should start while you're in school, while you have resources and friends and connections and keep it growing and see how far you can take it and then do whatever else you need to do in your life to support that growth after you leave school. And whether that means getting a job that comes home at night so that you're not tired <laughs> and that you can practice and you can, you know, write a grant and mm -hmm. try and put together a creative commissioning project, you know, that's what it needs to be. And I love, you know, taking the veil back of that idea because I also think that, you know, um, when you leave school, you shouldn't just be hung out to dry with like giving up on all of your artistic pursuits and just waiting to land the the big gig or the big audition. You know, um, I, I love empowering people to take that control and uh, try and shape their own own destiny. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Man. I, I feel like you should be a football coach. I'm like ready to <laughs> take on a fullback in ISO, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> um, so, Kari, I mean, I just can't thank you enough for joining me today. Before before I, I let you go for the day, uh, do you have any last words or shout outs or some advice? I, I feel like you've already given enough advice for it to last a year, but or any uh, words of wisdom? I always just like to give my guests a chance to just sort of speak whatever's on their mind and, and say whatever they want to say or, you know, talk more about Acropolis, whatever you want to do. Sure. Have at it. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, it's such a great platform and podcast. And I think you're just doing awesome things. So thank you so much. Very cool to be a part of it. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is that like, if you're listening to this and you have any questions about anything that I've talked about, anything has resonated with you, uh, please reach out. Um, my email is just my name at acropolisquintet.org. And, um, you could just reach out about anything that you're curious about. I love I love helping people. I love, you know, talking about anything and everything about this journey if it's something that you're resonating with. And Acropolis in general is very open and accessible. Um, we're we have like a chef mentality 
where we believe we should share everything about our journey and our process. We're incredibly transparent, and we think that that's the best possible way to help support other artists in our industry. So you're curious about anything, you can just reach out. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got lots of good, fun, new stuff coming out in the next couple months. So um, check us out online and um, yeah, listen, listen up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Kari, thank you so much. Uh, it's really been a pleasure, and and just to hear your passion has me inspired. So, so thank you. It's you know, and this is actually the first time we've met, so yeah, uh, it's just terrific. And I look forward to continuing this friendship. And uh, you know, maybe we can. Uh, who knows? Maybe you guys might need three clarinetists in the future. Just get me in there. I'll play. I'll I'll rock some contrabass clarinet or something for you guys. You got that'd, be, it. that'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. All right. So if you guys haven't had the chance already, please uh, be sure to stop by our website at candyclarinetistpodcast.com where you can find more information about myself, the podcast, and links to all of our content platforms. Once again, I am Sam Rothstein and thanks for tuning into the Candid Clarinetist Podcast.